hello everybody. Uh, if I've done everything correctly, then we are now live. Welcome to everybody that is joining us live and everybody that's been waiting. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all. To anybody watching this as a VOD, welcome to you as well. We are today going to be going through the Tetras and the Piranhas and working out and showing you how to play them correctly in 10th edition. Now, 10th saw a bit of a shakeup for how we run things in 9th. You never would have seen a Piranha. You never would have seen a unit of Tetras. And then all of a sudden, 10th rolls around and they are two of our best units. Now, for me to start off, I think the best way to, for us to go is to actually bring up the data sheet and examine that first for exactly why these units are as good as they are. So, also, I hope you'll like my my new desktop background. I'm very happy with it. Uh, definitely haven't uh, shown it to the wife and pretended that she cared. So, let's go into, first and foremost, our Piranha. Now, uh, exactly where it is in the index, here we go. So, there's a couple of things for us to be aware of when we touch the Piranhas, and we'll go to the Tetras next. The first is that the Piranha has a Scout 9 move. This is very, very important for the role that the Piranha fills, which is to slot into what used to be our Montcar uh, Breacher Fish as our first point of contact within a game. Uh, now, with a 9-inch pre-game move, and then a hopping 14-inch move. We have a very, very speedy unit that on turn one will go 23 inches, regardless of what direction. But if we go first, usually that's forward. Now, we these things also sit, and this is the same for the Tetras, at a T7, seven wound body with a four up save and an OC of two. Now, the other thing for us to look at is drone harassment tactics. I will zoom in on that for any of our Vodders. At the end of your movement phase, select one enemy unit within 12 inches of this unit. That enemy must take a Battleshock test. Notice that it does not say one enemy unit in line of sight within 12 of this unit. So if they're on the other side of a wall, they still have to take a Battleshock test. Now, I'll bring this up a little bit later on, but this makes it so that Piranhas make us one of the only armies in the game that can score capture enemy outpost turn one, which is where you need to control your enemy's objective. And I'll be going through the ways that I do that when I start getting into how I throw these piranhas around in very chaotic ways and catch a lot of people off guard. Uh, hello, Zachara. Before the stream starts, I want to say good morning from the UK, but also is the, the best way to pilot Tetris to actually own some? Yes, sir, it is. Yes, sir, it is. Uh, and if GW don't do a restock soon, then theoretically speaking, print a go burr. Uh, so that is our Piranha. Let's look at the Tetras, which I cannot... Yeah, third data sheet. Let's go. So these bad boys are rocking, you'll see. Same movement characteristics, same toughness, same wounds, same save, same OC. It's almost like they share a uh, a base hull with the Piranha. The important thing for these guys, for me though, aside from high intensity marker lights, which is their guide for a unit and give that unit full rerolls to hit, which is why you're seeing Tetras predominantly across basically every list, but also infiltrators. And this is something that I've found a lot of Tau players don't use to the uh, full impact that they should otherwise be able to. These guys being able to infiltrate means that there is basically no reason for you to not have an angle to be able to guide for a unit that you want to be guiding onto. It just takes a little bit of forward planning. Now, with that out of the way, let's go into Tabletop Simulator and I will show you guys exactly how I use them from deployment phase all the way to winning a game. And there are a few uh, tips and tricks that I'll be able to go through. A lot of it is going to be, you know, your uh, your standard fundamentals of the game. It's the first uh, competitive quickie that I put out on my channel, which is a, a YouTube shorts series that I'm doing where I just spend 60 seconds talking about a particular thing that I think people should know and will make them a better player. Uh, and this one was the absolute first thing that came up because fundamentals of the game are stuff that you can basically plug and play onto any army and you will do well. 
Uh, all right, so let's bring up my one that I've got loaded before. I've been using this a lot for my coaching sessions, so uh, there will be stuff everywhere, so don't think that that's part of a scenario or stuff that you need to replicate. I've been uh, furiously, furiously uh, moving stuff around and using different things. So let's chuck our army on this side of the board. Uh, why can't I grab you, Mr. Ghost Kill? There we go. And we've got our unit of Tetras there. I think I've got Piranhas. One of them is probably flipped upside down because I was killing stuff off. All right, let's chuck these back up. Chuck those back there. And we've got an extra Piranha just over here. Oh, now, one thing that I did want to talk about that I haven't yet is also the weapon systems. Because I believe that this will actually factor into uh, what you put on different things. Now... Uh, the, the Tetra, I'm not going to go over. It has pulse rifles. They're 30 inches. They're rapid fire. So if you're within 15, you get four shots with the two vehicle unit instead of just the base two. Uh, they're a meme. I love it. If I can get a, uh, a couple of shots off and take a wound off something because it's hilarious. Uh, the only other thing that you really need to be across is that they are a vehicle. So if you charge them at somebody, you can rip the one CP for, uh, the uh, mortal wounds, uh, the tank shock, that's the word that my brain wanted to have. Though, bear in mind, they only have a strength three, so you're only going to be rolling the, you know, sort of base number of dice with no extras. It becomes less of a, a good prospect for fives with rolling three dice and no chance of having extra. Uh, so, what I will go through is the piranha. Because there is a particular way that I always do mine. First off, they should always be carrying two seeker missiles. I... I think the app has these on by base, but if they don't, always make sure you're carrying two. You are able to fire off both missiles in the same turn if you wish. Uh, one shot does not mean that you can only shoot one of them. I saw that come up on, I think it was the Tau Reddit or Tau Facebook page recently. You can fire both. It just means that once you fire them, they're gone for the rest of the game and you're not getting them back. Though they are some of our best anti-tank. Uh, the thing that often comes up is between the Piranha Burst Cannon and the Piranha Fusion Blaster. In my opinion, you will never want to take the Piranha Burst Cannon. You want to take the Piranha Fusion Blaster because one, it's Melter 4. And because we're going 23 inches in the first turn, you're almost never not within six inches of something that you might want to shoot. Uh, even though it is only strength nine and against a lot of big vehicles, you're, you're wounding on fives, Melter 4 is something that your opponent will always have to play against. And the Burst Cannon really... I don't find myself wanting the Piranha to kill a lot of infantry units. Mostly I want them to punch a hole in something that my opponent doesn't want me to. And then, spoiler alert, I'll charge them into something else. Uh, or just stand in the way body blocking. Uh, what is up, good sir? Masu, good to see you as always. Uh, you can re-roll the hit roll. Confirm this wording means all failed rolls or just one failed roll or is it everything including passes new to the hobby? Sorry for the newbie question. No, no problem at all, Kane. Uh, so when it says you can re-roll the hit roll, it means that you can re-roll as many of them as you wish. So generally speaking, successes are like you've hit and they've succeeded, though there is within the fast rolling rules and general tournament etiquette. Uh, if you say to your opponent, hey, it's my Cal Yun turn, I'm not just going to re-roll failed rolls. I'm actually going to re-roll anything that isn't a six because I want to get those double exploding sixes before you throw all of your dice. That is a statement of intent which will allow you to re-roll any of the dice that you want to. Generally speaking, I will only do that if I know that I need an overwhelming amount of volume or I'm doing it, say, on something like a commander where I'm hitting on twos. So re-rolling a stack of dice, I've got a good chance of really not missing that many. And so the extra sixes will be worth it. If I'm hitting on fours or above, that becomes a bit more of a coin flip because if you have a really good hit roll and, you know, you've only missed a couple of times because you rolled hot, but you told your opponent, hey, I'm going to re-roll all of these, that statement of intent stands. You need to pick up those dice and go again. So really the, the re-roll will depend on how likely you are to succeed, but you get the choice as to what you re-roll to answer your question. Uh, 40k up doesn't, lol, I've had to pick two seekers every single time. I thought so. I didn't want to say that, you know, with any sort of certainty because it has been a while since I built a brand new list. Make sure you put those seeker missiles on. You get them for free. You get two of them. Do not miss out on the best anti-tank in our index. Uh, Reroll of fail ones, YouTube Freemium. Thank you, YouTube Freemium. Uh, 
Jeez, and thanks. I'm finding 40k rule wording on a number of things quite confusing. Yes, there is a lot that you will have to chuck your lawyer hat on. Uh, the, the, the rule system does reward nerds for being nerds. So if you're willing to read, if you're willing to go through comprehension, all that sort of stuff, generally their wording is very, very specific. So if you follow, you know, the proper English way of examining a sentence, which, you know, don't get me wrong, is an absolute clusterfuck. Uh, but yeah, usually you can, you can nut some stuff out. Uh, all right, so... Where I was saying uh, Fusion Blasters, Melter 4. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out, which a lot of Tau players don't know or get caught out by, the Twin Pulse Carbine is Assault. Now, why is this relevant? There have been sometimes on certain deployments or where I've had to deploy in a certain way against opponents, and I'll come back up here, like with this, uh, you know, side to side, where I have actually needed, let's say I've got a piranha which started. That's where my other guy is because I was talking about the center. Thank you, Jay. Oh, I hate this. I hate this. Yep, here we go. Here we go. Cool. So this guy, I realized that I, you know, in my first turn, draw two cards because I will always take tactical secondaries. I don't like fixed because I don't like giving efficacy to my opponent over how I score. And I draw, say, behind enemy lines. And I go, cool. I do my 9-inch pregame move. I do my 14-inch move. I go 23 inches. And damn, I'm not close enough. This guy, because I deployed him on the line and he's able to go there. All right, I am just off as well. If I want to achieve this, I actually need to advance. And say one of the other ones is deploy teleport homer. I go, okay, cool. That piranha is going to advance. My opponent goes, but you won't be able to shoot. And I'm like, ha ha, I don't care. I roll a two, which obviously isn't enough. But let's say I roll average. So four, <clears throat> excuse me. And four puts me, if I'm going shortest way, I'll fuck this up because of those. But my advance gets me into my opponent's deployment zone. I then score behind enemy lines and I get deploy teleport homer because the assault keyword, even though I don't care about those twin uh, carbines, that assault keyword allows me to still perform an action as far as the deploy teleport homer or whatever other action card in the secondary deck allows me to do. So from not having or not using that rule, I'm sitting back here with my thumb waving around going, cool, everybody, I'm a towel player. Two being at least on their deployment zone going, I am now scoring like 10 points for this round, maybe more depending on the cards because not all of them are at five points. So understanding their weapon systems, how they interact and what you want to take is very important. Do not rob yourself of having assault. That is such a powerful ability in 10th because they basically took it off everything that we had almost. And having this ability is just so good to have that advance and shoot. So with their weapon systems out of the way, let's talk about how I will deploy them. And there are two big things that I want to talk about here. And we'll start with the Piranhas and we'll go into the Tetras. But a lot of this stuff will overlap. Generally speaking, my Piranhas, because they are my first point of contact. And what I mean by that is they are going to be the first thing that meets the enemy. They are going to be the fastest thing that I have. They go, go an enormous distance, which means that there is very little that my opponent can do to hide from them. So if I have, and let's just chuck some of these, these Space Wolves on there. I know that they're not the most popular army in the world right now, but they're what I have on the table. So let's just go with that. Uh, Dreadnought just hanging out, being a bird. So, because they're a first point of contact, generally speaking, I will deploy them hard on the line. But what I will do is also pre-measure so that if I don't go first, I can move back into a position which defends them or just completely breaks line of sight so that my opponent can't interact with them. Same, same for if I'm versing somebody like World Eaters, where they've got a bunch of like really fast units, potentially pre-game moves, and also with their corn dice ability, able to get advance and charge, they can go an enormous distance. So I will pre-measure and look at where I need to be, use that pre-game move to move away from that and say, yes, you can move. Yes, you can advance. But if you do that, you're going to have like a 10 inch charge to get to me, which most World Eaters players really won't want to take the chance that they roll a six on the advance roll and they roll an 11 on the charge roll. So 
that is generally how I'll deploy them. But there are some little, uh, li little caveats that I'll put down. The first is that if my opponent has infiltrators, I will be playing the counter infiltrate game. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say that this unit of uh, Space Wolves in the center, uh, Shadow Sun, you're not one of them, you traitor, get away from there. Let's say that they are Space Marine infiltrators. Now, when we get to deploying, if I've got ghost kills, which a lot of my list will do have because I love ghost kills, they've got infiltrators, I've got ghost kills, I've got tetras, and I've got piranhas. Now, these interact because a lot of pregame move abilities state that you cannot end your pregame move within nine inches of the enemy deployment zone or not within nine of uh, an opponent's model. So my opponent, if they want to, can just go, cool, I'm going to hang out right here. My infiltrators are here. I'm nine inches away from your deployment zone. But this piranha that you very, very stupidly put down right here now cannot pregame move into the center. You will have to go the long way around this building and around that way, wasting valuable, valuable time going forward. So I will generally speaking not have my piranhas as the first thing that I put down when my opponent has infiltrators to put down as well. Generally, I will try and use my first infiltrator lay down to just go cool, ghost kill right there, pre-measured. Uh, pre so you got a couple of things here, but it's just bolters or whatever. You're not going to be able to touch them and thereby opening up this side of the board to have them pre-game move there. Now we start getting into identifying your weak side and your strong side of the board, uh, sort of estimating and playing a mind game with your opponent where they will allocate resources depending on what fire lanes you've got. But if I'm fairly confident that if my list has like say Sky Rays and Devilfish and Crisis, that he's not going to want to have a bunch of stuff sitting out in the open here to go and try and tag this ghost kill in melee. And because I'm a good opponent, I will let my opponent know that it has fallback and shoot anyway. So even if you touch him, I'm able to kind of fly over your head and do what I want anyway. You start playing this chess match of, okay, my opponent probably doesn't want to go down here. So I can happily put piranhas here. But if I put piranhas here, what are they achieving? Are they just trickling onto this objective? Are they doubling up the ghost kills? So on and so forth. And then because I've put down there, he may or may not want to put down his infiltrators. And I will hold my piranhas from getting deployed until I know where his stuff is and where I can get the most out of my pregame move. Now, because we're talking about infiltrators, let's talk about our beautiful little Tetras. Because at this stage of the game, deployment phase, I will work out where I want to put them. Now, obviously, there is an argument to be made for having them all the way at the back. And I will often do this, hanging out with my Sky Rays or whatever, because Tetras are fantastic backfield objective holders and screening units. Now, the reason that I say this is that our guiding rule does not require a range. It just requires line of sight. So you functionally have infinite distance on the Tetras, getting full value out of the reason why you bring them, which is that they are a T7, seven wound uh, unit of two, thereby 14 wounds that can guide and get full rerolls to hit even with only one model remaining. So having them at the back is a perfectly functional way to have them. I, however, like to do some very, very cheeky stuff with them because they've got infiltrate. And I was saying this when we were overlooking the, uh, sorry, looking over the abilities before. If I can guarantee that this is a safe position outside of the deployment zone, and I know that he can't get an angle on me if I position these correctly, let's say these are a little bit longer or this is a proper L-shaped building that you would have on a lot of things. If he hasn't deployed any long-range anti-tank shooting down here, I'm pretty certain that he won't be able to touch these. This means that on my turn two, I have a unit, if, even if I don't move these at all, that I can just push out, get line of sight, maybe walk on and touch this objective or move up so that he can't deep strike units around here. This means that I have gained, what, seven inches extra distance off this unit by checking beforehand that I can't be touched here, I am safe, and if they don't have any decent shooting here, this is functionally the same as them being behind a ruin entirely. So think more broadly about how you can use your Tetras and their infiltrate ability to gain dominance over the board and have the angles that you need to have on the turns that you have them. So uh, I'm just going to uh, check our chat. 
Uh, looks like it is just chatting to each other. Okay, so no problem. Now, one thing that I want to talk about is something you can do with the Tetras, which is a very, very, very cheeky little thing. Now, if I know that he's waiting for me to pop my head out, I will generally abuse two-inch coherency and just pop one out. Now, why would I do this? As I said before, I don't need both models to be able to see the unit that I'm guiding for. So if there is, let's say, a sky ray, I just poke his nose outside of this terrain and I'm able to throw seeker missiles down that way. In return, if he has, say, this dreadnought able to shoot at him, if he can't kill the full 14 wounds in one activation, I kill the front one with whatever wounds he does get through, assuming that he gets seven wounds through. And then everything else here can't target this other one because I've killed the only model that's in line of sight. If he gets uh, shots onto this guy and brings him below full wounds, that will count as the unit being below half strength, meaning that I will have to take a battle shock test on them. However, if he doesn't, if he just does seven wounds or you know, he's got multi-damage attacks which kill this, but there's wasted damage that doesn't splash over. This guy's on full wounds. He doesn't have to take a battle shock test. And he is just as functional as a two-man unit to the next turn, go out, stand on this objective, do whatever I need, or still be super safe and just be back here going, all right, I'm just going to rotate a little bit. From the tip of my nose, I'm able to see that Dreadnought. Skyray throws shots. He dies, but the other stuff down here can't see him and therefore can't target him. So he is getting value over and over and over again, still giving me a nine inch bubble of deep strike denial. And that is one of the best things that you can do to play with your Tetra unit to, if I use the example of being here around this terrain, I'm just going to pull him around there. If I'm hidden behind a wall and I just put one on the other side, flying around, of course, because fly doesn't get around anymore, but same thing. I've got one Tetra model, happy and safe inside here. If they can't kill both models in one activation of a unit, kill the front one, second one's back there. I still have a full functional unit. Now, moving back to my piranhas. Let's say you get first turn and let's say everything goes your way. We move 23 inches forward. And we've got a character that wants to go here. We've got Thunderwolf Cavalry here. The Infiltrators are sitting here and we don't care about them. So we go nine inches forward this way, staying outside of nine of them. I'll just move them that way because we won the uh, the counter, uh, counter deploy war. And so we have a bunch of piranhas. Come on, don't be a dick. Why are you attached to a wall? What? I've never done that before. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, he doesn't exist anymore. He's dead to us. So we get our piranhas here and we go, cool. We would love to touch this Thunderwolf Cav. So we throw all of our Seeker missiles and our fusion. Let's say we get a couple of them through and that unit is now functionally crippled. I look at it and go, okay, one Thunderwolf Cav isn't that scary to me anymore. Uh, I know that he can't use stratagems on him because I made him take a battle shock test and he failed. And I've also got this other unit over here that's carrying a bunch of heavy bolters and machine guns. Uh, sorry, uh, and, and plasma guns and missile launchers and whatever else. I don't want you moving anywhere. Uh, opponent, do you have fallback and shoot? No, I don't. Okay, cool. Uh, I am going to go for a nine inch charge. Same as deep strike and I don't lose anything for doing it. So let's go that. If I get that in, holy shit, we did it. First time, every time, boys, let's go. So this piranha then goes in and touches these space wolves. And now this unit that may have had like advance and shoot or would have been able to move forward to get a line of sight around this building is now staying put and has to fall back and functionally waste a turn. At the end of the day, we know these piranhas are going to die. They have served their function. But if I can get them in and if I've got the CP and I tank shock them, uh, I'm only strength four on them, so I'm going to be rolling four dice. Let's just grab out two more. Looking for fives. We kill a marine on the way in. Cool. So there is some of their shooting gone. They have to fall back and shoot. These piranhas were going to die anyway, but what it means is that this opponent's lines stay about the same place. These dreadnoughts can move up. That's fine. We can't stop everything on the board. And I probably would have this piranha who is now one with the building for whatever 
goddamn reason. I uh, could have had over here to move block them or whatever, but we can't stop everywhere, but we have just shut down this side of the board. And if you see how much stuff I've deployed over here, this is functionally their strong side of the board. And I will be making a video about this, about identifying your strong side and your weak side and how that can really interact with your game. But now these piranhas are sitting inside theirs. And if I got anything for like behind enemy lines, I just charge my way into his home field. And as long as they don't kill me and because they're holding just normal ass weapons, they're probably on a close combat profile. It's probably only strength four. I'm T7. They're wounding on fives. Singular damage. It's very unlikely that they kill me. I've then achieved that. And I'm pretty obnoxious in the process because nobody likes to fall back and shoot or fall back and charge because they're, one, very rare, and two, they have to go around my body if they don't have fly. So I've just kept them in this position and they don't really get to do the move that they want to do. And that is a fantastic way to make your opponents hate piranhas until the end of time. So with piranhas and tetras, that is functionally all of the knowledge I have to impart over how to deploy them, what to consider with enemy infiltrators, enemy uh, advanced moves and all that sort of stuff, uh, using them to charge and really be obnoxious. Now, actually, sorry, one thing I will say, do not charge piranhas into something that will pick them up. Like, for example, these dreadnoughts with the big-ass claws, do not charge them into that. What you want to do instead is just say, like, stay a decent distance away. And this actually brings up another point. I'm glad I didn't close off there. If I am here and their base is too big to move through here without being one inch away and they don't have fly, this is functionally the same as this. But it's better because they can't move through here because their base is too big and they can't go within one of me and they have to go around or try and go around the building and the walls and everything else. So do this to move block them instead of this if you're worried about them picking you up. Like if I didn't get anything through on that Thunderwolf Cav, I don't want him to be able to pile in, get extra distance, absolutely mince me, and then I've just wasted a piranha for no reason. Then on their turn, they just run over fat and happy. And it's the same with things like stealth suits. It's the same with your Tetras. It's the same with whatever. Judge whether it's better to touch them in combat because it's unlikely they'll kill you and it's more obnoxious or if just standing in a really obnoxious position achieves what you want it to achieve anyway. Now, this brings up another thing. If this is a knight, I don't want to stand here because he's just going to walk over me. He can walk over me as if I don't exist. Not armages or warhounds or whatever they are for Chaos Knights. That This is still functionally good for them because they can't walk over you. But if this is a big boy and he's going like 14 inches or whatever, he doesn't care about you being here. He cares about you being there because if he can't finish over the top of you, fully clearing you and being outside of one, he cannot start the move. So if I'm sitting about here, he has to end his move about there. I functionally cut his move in half, which is very, very, very obnoxious. There is actually a video that I did a, a back in ninth edition. Uh, it was about crude hounds. So if you type in why crude hounds, uh, that information is still evergreen because I talk about how to use that tiny little unit to be super obnoxious into big units. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the stuff with crude hounds may have changed slightly, but the information is still really, really, really good. Uh, Moody, I didn't see you in the chat. Apologies, my man. Good morning from Scotland. Glad to chat you live for a ch uh, Sorry, I've been talking for so long. I'm just going to take a drink because my mouth is actual sandpaper right now. Oh my God, that's so good. Oh my God. Good morning from Scotland. Glad to catch a live stream for a change. Been down with the chest. Oh, dude, that sucks. Uh, for the better part of two weeks now, I'll take it the PC is fixed. The PC is purring. Now, do I have the standoffs for my CPU cooler? No. Have I got my CPU lying down on its back with a, a glass over the top of... Actually, I think I can show you guys. Hang on. I'll, um, I'll take you off the green screen and I'll just grab this camera. Ugh. I've got a Stein sitting on it, holding the CPU down because I don't have the standoffs for the cooler so I can't stand it up. But uh, yeah, so let's get that back on there. Am I still in the green screen? Yes, I am. Oh, first time every time. Let's go. Um... So yes, the PC is looking good. Uh, it took a long, 
long ass amount of time. I'm talking like 70 hours, not including sleep and work and whatever, like actual 70 hours sitting in front of this goddamn PC trying to fix it. And actually massive shout out to one of my patrons, uh, Darrell, uh, who actually gave me some IT support uh, during the entire process. I really couldn't have gotten to the fix without them. Uh, I gave them a uh, chasseau in the, um, in the discord server uh, for a month just to say thank you. Uh, but really, really sorry that you had your chest infection. Hopefully you're on the mend. Um, I'll be looking at playing some games. So if you've got some time and you're bedridden or whatever, uh, you can hang out because Rogue Trader is fucking good. It is really good. Uh, watching your stuff and Skari, the Drakari player. Oh, I love Skari. Uh, I'm really seeing the strength of move blocking. Only started in 10th. Uh, Stop when third came out. Yeah. Move blocking is something that if you're not doing it as a competitive player, you are basically wasting the potential of a lot of units to get put into a list. And if, you know, you're, you're just net listing off somebody who does well in the tournament scene or like, you know, shout out to Art of War who was sponsoring my team's event coming up. Uh, Art of War's War Room has a bunch of different stuff. They can write lists for you. But if you see something that like, say, Richard Siegler or John Lennon is playing and there's a unit that doesn't quite make sense because it looks kind of ass on the data sheet, it's probably being used for objective play and move blocking and all that sort of stuff. So getting better at that and it won't be straight away. You will get your ass handed to you. You need to go through that process, but it is very, very worth your while. Um, if you can't finish over the top of you, my mind's so immature. Oh my God, I missed that. I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you caught it. Uh, I've certainly changed Catan Shard of the Void Dragon, trying to stop it from doing its hype crypting. Yes, yes, screening is... Uh, so. Oh, it did not go well. Oh, no. Oh, lordy. Uh, Dan is in the chat. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Combat Tower? You know it. It's my favorite thing to do. Catches everybody off guard. Uh, IT support brain is screaming at the glass on the CPU. <laughs> I'm glad I could trigger somebody with that. Weirdly though, it works because I had a bunch of, um, I had a bunch of thermal paste and because I applied it properly, put it down on there. Even when I take the glass off, it's fine because it's kind of like created a seal that just, it's not moving. And I'm, I'm scared to look at it because it's all working and it's not going away. Um, Resourceful for sure, hundred uh, percent. Cheers from Denmark. Hello, Ga Gamli, Ga Gamel, Gamle. If you're feeling fancy, uh, I'm sorry, I probably just butchered that. But hello, hello. Really appreciate you guys. Very informative, well explained. Thank you very much. I do appreciate all the feedback. Uh, Canadian Jeff, I'm going to assume that you're Mexican. Uh, great info on the pregame positioning and mind games. Thank you very much. That is what all of this is for. Uh, glass should have water in it if it's water cooled. I am not going to go with that because if anything bumps this, if I have a puppy that gets overzealous or I have a Chelsea that gets overzealous, because let's face it, I have to build everything around her, probably knocking it over or running into it. Uh, that is a terrible thing to have a glass of water in there. That would be my nightmare, honestly. Um, but yeah, thank you very much to everybody for joining the stream, for the feedback and everything else. Uh, it was a relatively quick one today. Uh, piranhas and Tetras are... Once you wrap your head around them, they're not insanely complex. Where you start getting some of the complexity is in the decision-making of when do I throw stuff in. And that's something that I feel like a lot of Tau players don't develop. Like, uh, you know, Dan in the chat uh, is a local to me, very good friend of mine. Uh, also does commission painting. So if you look up his uh, Moritz Studios, uh, he does some fantastic painting. Uh, he's an Eldari, Drakari, and Harlequins player. Um... And, you know, he will develop combat skills because he has to for his army. He, he doesn't get to just win the game. Obviously, Eldari in 10th is a little bit of a, a different beast, but I know that Dan loves his Harleys and his Drakari sort of for, first and foremost. Uh, and if you don't develop those combat skills, you don't win with the army. Whereas Tau, because we're all shooting, we don't develop this stuff and you don't learn the the decision making points to estimate how much damage somebody's going to do to you whether it's worthwhile moving it forward and i know personally doing some of this stuff against dan has really taught me a lot because i've had a combat player go hey so you did this this is why it didn't work out this is what i want to do and this is what i will do in in response if you had have left that unit there this fucks my plan this way or this way and I've been able to have these people to have these chats about who have already developed these skills so make sure that you go through it you will get your ass handed to you you will do some stupid shit but that is what I do in practice games I say to my opponent hey I'm just gonna do th this is really dumb 
but I kind of want to see how this plays out. And I want to know firsthand what's going to happen. So you guys will have to do the same. Develop that combat brain. Nobody expects the combat towel. And the, the unseen combat towel is the deadliest. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of everything for the Tetras and the Piranhas. Wrap your head around them because they are some of our most powerful tools. Also, do not forget about strategic reserves. And that, that reminds me, in a list where I'm running three Piranhas and potentially three Tetras, I will actually strat reserve one of each because being able to walk on the board from really obscene angles gives you a lot of power. So for anybody who left the stream early because you thought that was everything I had to say, I apologize, I really do. Stuff comes to me at weird moments. Uh, but strategic reserve is very important. Turn one and two, you're only able to come on on your side of the border in no man's land. Turn three onwards, you're able to walk in from anywhere that isn't their board edge. So you're able to come in because there's always an angle for you to come in uh, to their deployment zone. And by turns... You know, two being around here, you're probably killing a little bit. Turn three, they're in the same position as you where they've had to spend resources to stand on objectives or whatever. Generally speaking, people don't have enough to block you out from their deployment zone unless you're having a very, very, very conservative game. So strategic reserve, you must come on wholly within six inches of the board edge that you're from, but it's still super powerful. Super, super powerful. That's going to be a disaster for sure, Dan. Well, then again, we ain't here for the normal. <laughs> Moody, I have no idea what you mean. And it's weird that you brought that up unprompted. I am 100% normal and never do anything weird. I don't, for example, have a skit where I am uh, on the phone to my lover, Reptar, and Chelsea catches me in the act. No, sir. Not at all. Uh, what call were you in when you served? I started out in artillery. Um, by the time I finished, I was... Uh, basically deconflicting army and air force assets at a brigade level. Uh, so it was very like high level stuff, but started out as a cloud puncher doing surface air missile systems. Uh, I actually think I changed job like for every chapter of my life. So like cloud puncher, uh, Afghan doing something different, came home doing something different. And then, uh, yeah, uh, water and electricity mix shockingly well. Oh my God, Dan. Okay. So Dan does nothing but dad jokes. Or bad Eldari jokes. I give him three at every tournament we go to. And of course he uses those three like within the first five minutes. One comment up, mate. I didn't even know what you're pointing at, Moody. Oh, well. Uh, very nice. I'm currently JFO in Brizzy, assuming you were you went to attack P then. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so, damn, a JFO in there. That's actually primarily what my job is now. Uh, I run a training facility for a unit that I can't really talk about. Uh, but a lot of my work is JFO and JTAC. So yeah, yeah. Uh, hope you're enjoying the content. It's actually funny how many defense people uh, you find through this hobby. At a, a lot of the events that I run, uh, there is always, uh, there's a guy that I get on really well with, Elliot. Uh, and there's a few of the other lads that come through from like different units and all different walks of life. Like, you know, combat engineers. Uh, I think there's one of the guys that's from the, uh, the chalk artillery unit that's down here in Sydney. Um, and then just like a ton of people commenting on videos and everything else. And, uh, yeah, so I hope, hope Brizzy's treating you well. Um, and actually you might know, uh, the two guys that run the, um, the dome up there. I uh, very, 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 very good lads. Really good lads. Uh, 100%, you know uh, my old bomber then. Uh, he's a sergeant at the unit you work at. No shit, I might do. Uh, Dolly and Lukey, yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, if the person I think you're talking about is likely Oki, I would assume. I love how this has just become a, a session of like two digs having a fucking mad chat. <laughs> For anybody who's here for Tower content, it's pretty much done. But uh, yeah, uh, if anybody has any questions, now is a great time. Uh, I will after this. What is it? Nine at night? Yeah, I've got some time for some uh, Rogue Trader. I think I'll shut down this stream and then I'll automatically go into some Rogue Trader. For, so for anybody who's wanting to hang out and see that absolute masterpiece of a game, uh, I will be doing that afterwards. But uh, yeah, if anybody's got any questions, chuck them in now. Uh, I am feverishly looking forward to the, uh, the data slate that's coming up. I'm, 
sort of anticipating that there's not going to be too many changes. Uh, however, uh, that's based on us getting a codex soon. Uh, so we may see some touches. As far as I know, GW has said that they want to bring up things that aren't really seen. I don't expect them to like slap down anything that we've got because we're not we're not crushing the meta right now. So I would imagine they would want to bring up some things that we don't really see. But uh, I'm actually kind of looking forward to uh, you know throwing some different things into a list because the GT list that I that I wrote and I've got a stream on showing everybody how to play it in this exact setup. Uh, it is the strongest thing that I've ever created in tenth. It is disgusting how easy it is to win games with that goddamn list. Uh, can you talk a bit about your target priority for Piranhas? Uh, deal the most damage with Fusion Blasts and Seekers or Move Block? Uh, so, Masu, to answer that question, yes. We, we want to do both. You want to do it simultaneously. So let, let's touch on this. Uh, so, when I am looking at my Piranhas, if I've got on the other side of the board things like Dreadnoughts, things like a transports are a really great one to throw it at because there are very few transports that are actually above that T9 mark. Like we're very lucky with having Devilfishes doing it like Orc Trucks or like T8 or T9. Uh, even, you know, you look at things like the uh, like Grey Knight Dread Knights and that sort of stuff. Stuff that we can throw the fusion into and have a good chance of success. Sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and you're like, I want this repulsor executioner to die. And so you just throw everything into that. Basically, what I think about is if I were my opponent, what would I not want me to shoot at the most? And a lot of the time that's like, you know, transports that need to, you know, go a certain distance and get onto the objective, and then sit there. So we have to destroy it. And then the boys get out and all that sort of stuff. Uh, if I've got angles on something that they really don't want me to touch, like for example, Necron players, if they've got like their doom stalkers, their, uh, their boats, their uh, destroyers with their big cannons and that sort of stuff. If my piranhas can get an angle on them, I will absolutely take with me a couple of those because they have to roll for their reanimation protocols. They may not get a full thing up, but if the seeker missiles and the fusion do their job in one activation, you just kill the unit and it's gone. So that is usually what I'm thinking about. How can I fuck my opponent as much as possible? I think about it in the same way as when I was single going out on the town, you know, what can I do to really fuck someone as hard as I can? Fuck, that was a terrible... T I'm sorry, I've got to let myself out. <laughs> Act like you're in your 20s and you're in an environment where, you know, it's a smorgasbord of whatever other person of your choice is, man, woman or other. Uh, so I, I hope that I hope that answers it. Um, Drakari buff, please, and give Harlequins love. Dan, 100%. Drakari have suffered for long enough. Harlequins got absolutely fucked in the index. I really hope that your codex brings them back because, you know, obviously you don't want them dominating like they did throughout a, a portion of ninth, but it was actually good having some variety of like, okay, I'm going into Eldari. I've got to think differently. I'm going into Drakari. I've got to think differently. I'm going into Harlequins. I've got to think differently. And having that so that the tournament scene wasn't as bland and there were like different flavors for people and all that sort of stuff. Because at the moment, I feel like Eldari's a little bit, a little bit one trick pony and Drakari's only played by the real diehards and they know they're not going to, you know, like 5-0 and a, a tournament. Um, I could see Tetra's getting a bump uh, just because it's an auto include four to a model. Yeah, I can absolutely see that. Yeah, Tetra's for 80 points are kind of ridiculous. Uh, I'm worried. I started Raven Guard Army this year. Of course, best Space Marine detachment is the Vanguard Spearhead. Yep. Uh, so I'll be getting nerfed before I even get started. Um, uh, maybe they may look at touching the actual units as opposed to the detachments. I know the Firestorm detachment is doing quite well. Uh, but if they do get touched, at the moment, the Vanguard Spearhead is doing way too much without having to really sacrifice anything. And to be honest, a lot of people are going after things like Ultramarines characters and that sort of thing. Uh, Marnius Kalgar is just ridiculous. So I think you'll be fine. And one thing that I say to everybody, like, if I, it, like for example, Dan, going back to him again, if he's on his Drakari and we're at like an RTT, I know that there is a good to decent chance that if I don't pair him round one, which unfortunately we do a lot because Dan and I pair each other all the fucking time, but he's probably going to get to the last round because even though, and this is what I was saying in the, the competitive quickie, learn the fundamentals and you will be able to step onto any army and do well with it. A pro 
on a bottom tier army is still going to do better than a brand new player on the absolute best meta, net listed, whatever, because of those fundamentals. So don't, even if they do get touched, don't let it get you down. If you learn it, you will be able to get a lot out of the army. And it may actually teach you some things that Tau doesn't. So uh, st stay the course. Um, so Zach to Dan, I wonder, I worry Jakari will just get points changes. They have practically no detachment ability. It may be if they're just holding us off until they get a codex, then maybe. But I would be pretty surprised if Drakari don't get any changes whatsoever. Uh, happy to eat my words, though. I've been wrong before. N not about Tau, but, you know, other stuff. Uh, is Tau getting a new combat patrol for 10th when the codex drops? Uh, they have Tau Empire Commander, one Fire Warriors, one Pathfinder, and a TY7 Devilfish in it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I would hazard a guess if I had to go out on a limb. We'll probably be looking at with the reveals that they did for the Crute Riders. I uh, I wouldn't go out and buy any new Crute or Vesper or anything else. I am actually going to wait until we see stuff from there because if they're teasing that, there's a lot of models that they could do a refresh on and we've seen that with other armies as well. So, you know, like Necron's got like a, a couple of brand new character models that from the old ones. They had like a new unit done. Uh... Oh, Bill, no. I didn't actually see that 37 minutes ago. I'm so sorry, my dude. Uh, I broke a mime's left arm. Don't worry, he still has the right to remain. So, oh, my God. Get out. Get out. <laughs> Thank you for the tier one sub, buddy. Really appreciate it. Uh, whatever hurts the opponent the most. Got it? Yep, that's... And if you can think about that... Sometimes what hurts your opponent the most is actually that like you hide everything and they can't see everything turn one. So then they're like, oh fuck, well I've got a turn where I can't do anything and they know the counter punch is coming because they have to move out to get secondary points and primary points and whatever else. That can sometimes be the most damaging thing for them even though you're doing no damage. So make sure you think broadly about what will hurt your opponent. Uh, also earlier you mentioned Tetra is suffering battle shock, but they're actually immune. Multi-model units go off starting model count for their under half strength count. Oh, I see. I was under the impression that if you lose a model and then lose wounds, that remaining one counts as under half strength. That is actually really great to know. I've been nerfing myself apparently. Oh, thank you, baby. Love you. Wife just brought in some dinner and it looks incredible. Some ravioli with some stinky green stuff on the top of it that's going to be incredible uh uh same for two man broadside teams yeah good to know good to know uh first live marco how you doing good to see you unfortunately you have caught the end of it but it will be available immediately as a vod on the channel so you can go back and watch the uh the live stream uh notice to make bad dad, dad jokes and bad pun that's what hurts your opponent more i want to say that you're wrong but i've been caught by it too many damn times all right, so with uh, all of those questions out of the way, we are going to drop this stream and we are going to immediately go into our next episode of Vogue Trader. Uh, I, I don't know if I've got a thumbnail done for this one already. I think I'll just do the stream and load the thumbnail later. So uh, for anybody who is wanting to hang out, wanting to see uh, one of the best 40k games that I've played in a long time, uh, don't go anywhere. Keep an eye on the channel. We will be back up with some Rogue Trader very soon. Thank you very much for everybody who has joined me. Thank you very much to all of my patrons uh, and my wonderful Shassos and YouTube members who keep my channel going. Uh, we have a Teams event coming up. Uh, in uh, It'll actually be for my birthday, the 10th of March. Uh, we are going to be having an Honor the All Father Teams event. Uh, and all of my patrons and YouTube members will have their name on a massive banner at the front of the event for everybody to see. So if you would like to join them, there is a Patreon link down in the description below where you can join. Uh, it is five USD for the bottom tier, gets you into the Discord, uh, gets you access to the community and everything else, some behind the scenes content with Patreon. Uh, Chasso tier members get a free session with me every single month to get some coaching or a list built or whatever else. Uh, all of my patrons get five... US dollars off the cost of any coaching. So if you know you're going to want it anyway, it's functionally free to join. So with that said, uh, everybody, thank you for being here and I will see you in my next stream for a little bit of Rogue Trader. Also, little thing for the start of this stream, just ignore where I come up and I'm on camera and then I go to please starting. That's not real. That's your imagination.